Transportation Research and Education Consortium. And welcome everyone to the Spring Friday Seminar. Um, this is the first week of the term, so um, we have a few logistics things to talk about with respect to the course before we get on with our seminar. Um, those of you, this is both a class and an open seminar to the public, and our audience is always mixed between students and the general um, public and professionals, etc. Um, the students in the class, I um, handed out syllabi. I don't know if anyone else needs one. And then um, I forgot my sign-in sheet. Uh, I'm going to pass around the sign-in sheet. If you registered for the class, your name should already be on here. You may need to add it. You can fill in your email and just check off that you're here. Um, just the one of the main requirements of the class is to make sure that this gets back to me wherever I am sitting or whoever the instructor in charge is. Um, this term, uh, Professor John Glebe and myself are the instructors of record for the USP version of the course, and Professor Miguel Figliosi um, is for the CE version of the course, and I was in such a hurry that I typed his name wrong on the, uh, there's an extra L in there on the syllabus, so I apologize for that. Um, anyway, I'm going to start sending this around, so check off your name if you're taking this uh, for credit. and. We, um, before I introduce our speaker, um, I want to do some introductions around the room so we know who's here. And I will also at this point let you know that because we do webcast the seminars, there uh, are microphones on most of the tables around the room that you should be using when you ask a question. And to get you in the habit of doing that, I'm going to ask you to use it when you introduce yourself um, and say your name. You need to touch the button that says touch, not really button, but the area that says touch, keep the red light lit while you say your name or ask your question. Um, those of you who the microphone isn't working or it doesn't exist will come around with this little, uh, this one um, for you to use. So why don't we start here with some introductions. Thank you. I'm Hadi Yamin. I'm a retired uh, civil transportation engineer and I'm I've registered for this course as an auditor student. I'm Ryan Dan. I'm in the Graduate Certificate for Transportation program. Okay. Why don't we just go? Um, I'm Erin Riom. I'm a second year MERP student with an emphasis in land use. Hi, I'm Anne Broach. I'm a prospective MERP student. I'm Oswald, a civil engineering undergrad. I'm Levi Roberts. I'm a first year MERP student. Justin Willard, a civil engineering student. Is there no microphone for you, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Internet. <laughs> I'm Alex Bugatti, civil engineering grad student. Just yell over here. Yeah, just lean. I'm Shaolay. I'm a senior civil engineering student. Here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Adam Moore. I'm a master's student in civil engineering. Spence Way is post back student. Christopher Weir, City of Portland Public Works. Oh, that some of them may not work. Not working. Um, David Moskowitz, uh, Transportation Certificate Program. My name is Isaiah. I'm a member of the public. Um, Dana Weissman, prospective MERP student. Lindsay Walker, second year MERP in Transportation. Bob Kellett, second year MERP. He's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Huh? He goes to our engineer student. <laughs> April Bertelson uh, um, with the City of Portland pedestrian coordinator and a MERP alumni. Great. We can go here. I think yours works. Keep it lit. Keep touching it. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel Jones, uh, Urban Design Certificate Program. John Mackler, staff with OTREC. Ellen Dorsey, upcoming MERP fall 2010. Kelly Clifton, civil engineering faculty. Oh, Miguel Figliozzi, civil engineering faculty. Uh, Chris Myers, community development undergraduate. Yeah, uh, Colin Routon, uh, postback and prospective MERP student. John Gleeby, uh, professor urban studies and planning. Okay. 
Thank you, everyone, for your patience and uh, testing you on your microphone abilities. And yeah, the microphones do not project. It's purely uh, for the web. Um, so without further ado, I am going to turn it over to David Hurwitz, who is an assistant professor in civil engineering at Oregon State University, one of our partners in the OTREC Consortium. We're very happy that he came up to join us today to talk about some of um, his research that he's doing. So turn it over. Thanks so much, Jen. So I'm very happy to be here today. I'd like to start just by thanking all of the, the staff and faculty members here at PSU and, and at the, the OTREC organization as well for inviting me to, to campus. It's awful nice to, to get outside of Corvallis every now and again. Um, I, I'd like to spend the, the bulk of today talking about uh, uh, this notion of the impact of driver behavior on dilemma zones at high speed signalized intersections. So my interest in this area comes from uh, most of the research that I've been involved in. I've always had a passion for trying to think about, trying to understand why uh, system users behave the way they do and what we as civil engineers can do to the build environment to impact that behavior. So why should the rest of us care about uh, behavior and dilemma zone issues? Um, this notion of transportation safety is probably the biggest overarching argument um, for looking at high-speed signalized intersections in general, um, but more specifically the dilemma zone conflict. So when we think about uh, critical safety failures at a signalized intersection, two kinds of crash scenarios jump to the fronts of our minds. Um, we think about right angle crashes, um, two vehicles trying to access the right of way simultaneously colliding in the middle of the intersection. And we think of rear end collisions, um, vehicles stopping short um, before they enter the intersection and being collided by a, a vehicle traveling either too closely behind them or a vehicle that had assumed they were going to clear through the intersection. It ends up that a large portion of serious injuries and fatalities occur um, under those two failure conditions. And quite a bit of that is due to this notion of a dilemma zone. So let's take a sec to describe the outline for today's discussion. I, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about the background of this issue. Um, dilemma zones at signalized intersections has been in the literature for something like the last 50 years. So this is not a new topic, but the complexity of this issue has um, continued to put it at the forefront of traffic safety and operations research. So we're going to try and define what, what this, this thing, this dilemma zone is, what the existing standards of practice are with in the US, um, and then some of the inconsistencies of what we're doing as, uh, as transportation engineering professionals in terms of design and signal timing and the like. I'd like to mention two experiments that I was a part of um, way back across the, the, the US in uh, the, the state of Vermont, um, a naturalistic study, and then one that looks at a particular signal system. And then we're going to describe some of the contributions from, th from that work. So what is a dilemma zone? One of the problems, um, I, I like to think of transportation as being a very complex, multifaceted discipline. And as such, um, it's critical that we accurately define and identify our problems in order to generate practical solutions. One of the big problems with this idea of a dilemma zone is we've used all kinds of inconsistent terminologies and definitions to describe the phenomenon. Um, it ends up the dilemma zone issue can be categorized, categorized in two different ways. Um, we're going to use for the first definition a type 1 dilemma zone. It's also been described as the dilemma zone specifically. It was identified first in the 1960s by, uh, by Gazis and, and a few of his fellow workers. Basically, we're talking about uh, a vehicle approaching a signalized intersection. And at the onset of the circular yellow indication, or the change interval, the driver has to make a decision. I'm either going to choose to stop at the stop bar, or I'm going to try and clear to pass through the intersection in its entirety. The type 1 dilemma zone, this region in space right here, is a region whereby the, phys the physical constraints of the system, the signal timing parameters, the position of the detectors, um, results in the driver not being able to correctly choose whether they should try and pass through the intersection or whether they should try and stop at the stop bar. Um, in front of that type 1 dilemma zone, um, it's pretty clear that the driver has the ability to make it all the way across the intersection before the right of way has been allocated to the side street. In uh, behind uh, that, that position of the type 1 dilemma zone, um, it's pretty clear that the driver has enough distance to stop at the stop bar. But in between these two values, they cannot make, uh, physically cannot make a correct decision. 
Now, this is a scenario that we've pretty much been able to rectify through appropriate timing practices, the placement of advanced vehicle detection, and some of these other traffic engineering strategies. The situation that's more interesting to me, the situation that's been uh, inaccurately described over a number of decades, is this idea of a type 2 dilemma zone, or a, an indecision zone or a decision zone. Um, that the inconsistencies in our lexicon, and one of the problems we've, we've had trying to nail down um, this idea, the type 2 dilemma zone describes the driver's uh, uh, difficulty in making the correct decision. So it's a region in space as a vehicle approaches a signalized intersection where the, at the onset of the yellow, yellow light, um, in advance of that type 2 region, um, most drivers are very comfortable deciding to clear the intersection and they know it's the right thing to do. Um, back over here, they are pretty comfortable deciding that they should stop at the stop bar uh, with a very high likelihood. But somewhere in between those two areas, um, Drivers don't really know what they want to do, and all kinds of errors, including uh, red light running, abrupt stops, and entering the intersection inappropriately occur. Um, so this is an issue that we, we want to spend a little bit more time thinking about. Um, once we identified sort of these two different dimensions of the problem, a bunch of researchers have spent time trying to describe the boundaries in space, where this type 2 dilemma zone actually exists on the approach, uh, on the approach to a signalized intersection. Um, the first sort of uh, boundary condition that was identified was based on driver decision making. A and they used the driver's decision to stop um, as the, the defining characteristic. And they said this region in space appears where between the threshold where 90% of drivers would choose to stop and the threshold where 10% of drivers would choose to stop. And you know, this bit of research came from Zagir and Dean and was identified in uh, something like 1978. Uh, the next sort of advance in terms of our understanding of where this space actually exists came from uh, Chang and his co-authors in 1985. And they used a, a different definition for the boundary condition. They tried to focus on a time to stop bar condition. So for each individual vehicle, um, how much time from the onset of the yellow uh, light would it require for that vehicle to reach the stop bar? Based on that, uh, Chang identified the fact that if you're greater than three seconds away from the stop bar, they saw a, a preponderance, 85% uh, or more, of drivers chose to, chose to stop at that threshold. But if you're less than two seconds away from the stop bar, um, almost everyone that they observed empirically uh, continue to pass through the intersection. So we marched through time, and a bunch of folks contribute to this body of knowledge. And in 2002, a researcher down in Texas, uh, Bonison and a number of his colleagues, tried to analyze all of the empirical results that were collected um, to define this, this uh, space on the approach to a signalized intersection. A and they ended up with uh, proposing this range of, uh, they adopted the time to stop our definition, and they, they, they identified a range between two and a half to five and a half seconds. And that's held relatively constant. There's still a little bit of debate whether it should be um, five seconds or five and a half seconds, but this has been fairly consistent over the last eight years or so. So as a, a transportation engineering professional, one of the first things that I try and look for when I see a problem and want to fix it is our manuals, our standards of practice. So how are people considering this problem and what design tools are out there right now? Well, the first thing that jumps to my mind for traffic signals is the MUTCD. So what is the message of the circular yellow indication? What is it intended to communicate to the drivers? Well, the MUTCD, and we went back to the, the 09 version, the brand new uh, hot off the bookshelves release, um, it basically says two things. Um, the position of the yellow occurs after the green and before the red, um, and the simple message it's communicating to drivers is your right of way is about to end. Um, and that's pretty much it. When you start thinking about uh, how long the change interval should occur, um, the MUTCD points to the Institute of Transportation Engineers and a manual that they developed called the Traffic Engineering Handbook, as well as a, a brand new publication, the, the Traffic Signal Timing Manual, that's, uh, that's on the bookshelves now as well. So when we look to the, the Traffic Engineering Handbook, they give you ranges, approximate values for what this, the duration of this interval should look like. And they recommend somewhere between three and six seconds. And they also weigh in the, the, with the, the clearance interval as well, which is the, the all red, um, which follows in some instances the, the change interval. A and they recommend values of one to two seconds. Now, over the course of uh, many years, design equations have been developed through ITE um, to help you approximate the durations of the, the yellow and the all red indication. And here's a sample of, of that work right now. 
these calculations are not uh, required standards. They're just recommendations. Um, so it's still left to question how frequently this tool is used for signal timing as compared to uh, a whole host of other strategies that are out there. Basically, we're taking into account here things like uh, the average approach speed of vehicles, or the 85th percentile speed, um, the width of the, the roadway, the length of, of the automobile, and other typical characteristics. So that begs the question, um, if there's no standard for how to time the yellow interval, um, what are people doing in practice? Well, in 2004, ITE actually did a survey of practicing professionals and asked them, um, how do you time your yellow intervals in your, in your communities? And the preponderance of folks responding to the study, you can get about 65% for both the yellow and the all red uh, timing equation, said we use the ITE values. That makes the most sense to us. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of other strategies out there. Um, so some folks will take a standard amount of time um, and they'll apply it to similarly functionally classed roadways. Um, other folks will identify um, a geographic area and use one fixed duration for their change intervals. Um, and some other folks take 10% of the, the posted speed limit and they just use that. Um, so there's, there really is no consistency across the U.S. about how these things are timed. And what it, is there a question from the audience? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's Sorry, just the graph doesn't add up to 100 percent. Oh, so, so you know what ends up happening? So within a particular municipality, um, they don't e they, they can use multiple strategies simultaneously. So some folks may choose to use the ITE timing equations in one area and then arbitrarily pick a duration um, for some other piece of infrastructure that they're also in charge of. So that's why you don't get a uh, 100 percent hit rate on that. I guess it's also worth mentioning that when ITE does surveys, they're surveying their own members. So you're getting responses from folks who are at least members of ITE and therefore tend to hold a little bit more weight with what ITE might hold up as a, as a standard recommendation. In addition to varying design practices across the country, we also have varying legal requirements, which adds another, another level of complexity to try and understand this problem. So there's, there's two sort of big picture laws. There's a, a, a permissive yellow law and a restrictive yellow law. So here in Oregon, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we operate under a restrictive yellow law. And that is to say, you know, if you're approaching an intersection and the circular yellow is activated, you're supposed to stop at the stop bar unless it is unsafe to do so. And it's also illegal to be in the intersection on the, during the, the solid red indication. Now that's actually not the case where I come from. So back in Massachusetts, we operate under a permissive yellow law. And that describes a situation whereby as long as the light's yellow, you can enter the intersection at any point in time as long as the front axle of your vehicle crosses the stop bar before it changes to red, and you can legally be in the intersection as long as you entered it in that fashion. Um, so when we think about the varying design standards, uh, varying driver interpretations of what this indication means, and then varying uh, legal enforcement strategies, uh, it's easy to see why drivers might have some difficulty understanding what they're supposed to do when they're exposed to the solid yellow indication. So this bring, bring us to a couple, of, a couple of interesting research questions. And there's certainly more, and we can discuss that towards the end. But I thought this would be nice to sort of streamline today's discussion. Um, one, is there a better way to describe this region in space that folks are, are having difficulties making their decisions? And could, could potentially more information allow us to drive better signal timing? Could we use lean on technology a little bit to, to accomplish that task? So we, we started with a naturalistic behavior study. So we went out and empirically observed how drivers were interacting with signals. Um, we identified five um, state-owned pieces of high-speed signalized intersection in the state of Vermont. And we examined both of the mainline approaches. So we had 10 approaches overall. We observed a total of something like 60 hours of uh, video collection at each individual um, location. And we grabbed something like 72 hours of per vehicle speed information at the advanced detector. Um, we used uh, road tubes and uh, you know, uh, automatic traffic recorders to grab our speed data. And we used eight millimeter cameras that were surreptitiously placed on existing infrastructure so that drivers approaching the signalized intersections uh, wouldn't know that they were being filmed. Um, and you can see uh, some unlucky soul uh, mounting cameras up off the ground to get a picture of where the vehicles are, uh, when the yellow light activates, and, and all that kind of information, and the speed of the individual vehicles approaching. In order to reduce that, the, the video that we collected, uh, we had to digitize it. So we used a software package that allowed us to digitize eight millimeter video. 
And then we built um, these uh, measurement intervals um, that were set uh, 50 feet apart, um, starting from the stop bar and marching all the way back about 600 feet or so. And with this, uh, with this collection scheme, we're able to transcribe where the vehicle was down to a, you know, an area of a 50-foot you know, window at the onset of the yellow, um, what, their, what their action was going to be, whether they continued through on the yellow, if they stopped at the stop bar, if they ended up running a red light, and how fast they were traveling. This is a sample of what some of that information looked like when we transcribed it and plotted it out. So if we look at the horizontal axis here, um, we're looking at 50-foot windows marching back from the stop bar, um, back to, in this particular instance, about 600 feet. And in each one of those intervals, we're describing the driver action that occurred at the onset of the yellow. So did the driver choose to proceed through the intersection? Did they stop at the stop bar? Or did they run the red light? And we've also got some summary information about the, the change interval that was being applied, the 85th percentile speed, and the posted speed limit at these particular locations. What we did is we, we uh, superimposed on top of this information that Bonison definition, that uh, two and a half to five and a half second time to stop our window, um, which is uh, described by sort of this shaded region in space right there. So what do we see in terms of behavior? Well, the general trend is, a, as drivers are very close to the intersection, they tend to, on average, continue to pass through, which is what we would anticipate. And you know, the further back we get, the greater the likelihood is that the drivers stop at the stop bar. But somewhere in that range, um, that two and a half to five and a half second range, we see a bit of variability between the driver decision making. And we also see uh, uh, an increase in red light running. Yes? So we, we looked at, um, we observed 600 hours of video at 10 <coughs> independent uh, approaches. We're looking at a single approach right now. Um, the total sample size that we transcribed was something like 3,000 individual vehicles. So the, the roadways vary a little bit, but I think the smallest sample size we had was about 350, 400 cars um, for, the, for the smallest <laughs> on that order of magnitude. So here, yes, question. Would these hours when you monitor uh, were in morning hours when people are rushing? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So we or took. You monitor them. I mean, this plotting I'm talking about. Have you divided like rush hour, uh, normal work hour? I mean, sure, sure, sure. So we're getting out to do the stores, supermarket, or whatever. Right, and right. Coming back home. Okay, I, I absolutely see what you're getting at. So we collected information throughout the daylight hours. So we have components of the day that were first thing in the morning, whenever it was sunlit and under dry conditions is when we were particularly making these observations, all the way up until dusk. So we had anywhere within that 12 hours during daylight for, for Vermont. Um, and we, we did start to think about if there were changes during peak hour conditions. These are particularly high speed, isolated, signalized intersections. So there isn't, um, a lot of the locations didn't have he heavily congested conditions. Uh, a couple did, but most didn't. Okay, so there's no need. You, you realize, realize that uh, plotting them separately, like this is a peak hour graph, this is non-peak hour graph. Is there any such thing as plotted? That or that's somebody like me. Yeah, I want to take a look and make a comparison. That hey, this is not the first of all. Right, right, right. But I, I strongly believe that, depending upon my experience, that in the morning hours, people are rushed. They, we don't want to say every minute they can get. So that's when I think they make a good decision. How the, the light is turning. When I, I mean, enough time, I say, just slow down. You know, I'm stopping there because I don't want to get a ticket. And nothing else to do. Right, right, right. Change of behavior. Uh, will be the factor in all these, uh, uh, you know, data which we are compiling. So my basic question was, is it possible for us to separate those Yes, you, th that's absolutely something that we could do. So we time-stamped every observation that we made, so we could aggregate it do down to peak hour. Day. No, it's an interesting question. So uh, actually, I'm, I have to interrupt a little bit, David. I'm, apparently there was a problem on the course schedule, so half of our students were in a different room. Okay. Um, on campus, so that's why all of a sudden um, a bunch of 
people just walk in. And so for everyone who came in late... Uh, do you want to take a step back? Know, and yeah. You don't need to go backwards, but what I do want to say is that um, we do webcast the seminar, so when you ask questions, we need you to use the microphone on the desk or this one when I come around. Uh, but maybe also, I don't know, in, in the interest of time, we want to make sure um, that we maybe save the rest of the questions until the end. Sure. We're doing just fine on time, so this won't be a problem. Um, uh, sure. So here's another example of one of the approaches that we took a look at. And we see the same sort of trends in terms of driver behavior and red light running tendencies appearing within that uh, type 2 dilemma zone region. Now, this is a, a third location where the that 2.5 to 5.5 second window doesn't seem to necessarily match up as well with the observations that we made um, as it did on some of the others. Um, so we were utilizing th that window in space. We were basing it off of a an 85th percentile approach speed. And it seems that under some situations, that, that's not necessarily a reasonable way to, to go about defining that space. It led me to the question, could we lean on technology to improve the, the timing mechanisms that we have? So we started searching around the country to try and find sensor systems that might be able to accommodate that. And we identified two companies that had been putting uh, radar-based mechanisms out there on the market um, to some degree of success. So we, we wanted to dig into those a little bit deeper. I'm going to call them space sensors. Um, in the literature over the last year or two, um, there have been a handful of articles that have described them as uh, wide area detectors. Um, you're basically talking about radar units mounted on the, the mast arm um, that have the ability to detect in real time the speed and position of vehicles over a footprint of about 500 feet. So if they're set about 100 feet back from the stop bar, that gives you uh, real-time information for vehicles within 400 feet of the intersection. And, and this is uh, one location that we installed. Uh, the, 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 the equipment was donated very generously by the manufacturer, and it was installed by the Vermont Agency of Transportation, and we appreciated uh, you know, all the help that we got from both of those entities. That's a picture of our sensor installed on the mast arm. And this is a shot inside the cabinet. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that software interface looks like um, in a moment. So like we said, um, this detection mechanism allows us to identify the position and speed of every vehicle approaching the intersection over a course of about 400 feet. And it actually allows us to define a region in space where this type 2 dilemma zone exists on our particular roadway. So we can use that time to stop bar definition over here and set whatever threshold we deem appropriate based on our observations and the kinds of problems that we're receiving. We can also identify minimum and maximum speed values for vehicles to be captured within that window. And if the system detects that a vehicle is going to be exposed to, based on the, the programmed timing scheme, is going to be exposed to a solid yellow indication, while it's captured within our defined type 2 dilemma zone, it can extend the green and move them in advance of that window to where the, the driver decision-making process is a heck of a lot easier on average. So we utilized our same methodology to try and consider what the, the driver behavior in this conflict area looked like under the advanced in-pavement loot detection. And this is a, an observation of about eight hours generating a sample size of something like just shy of 200 vehicles for this model. And we see the same sort of trends. Vehicles that are really close to the intersection proceed through. As you get further and further back, um, more tend to stop. And we see that a lot of that red light running behavior occurs in that two and a half to five and a half second window. Um, there was a fair amount of work, work out there that tried to define intersection safety in terms of uh, the number of vehicles that were captured within this region in space. Um, so we looked specifically at uh, the rates of vehicles being exposed to the solid yellow in the Type 2 Dilemma Zone. And for this particular sample, we saw that something like 12.3 vehicles were captured within that window during a given hour. Um, simple pre-post comparison. Then we looked at um, the, the number of vehicles that were captured within that window under the, that space sensor detection mechanism. It actually reduces. It goes down to about 9.8 vehicles per hour. We see, the, for our little sample, sample uh, size, we see red light running rates decrease substantially. And we see a shift in driver decision making. Um, that, that holding of the green advances a lot of vehicles uh, in front of 
that dilemma zone region in space where they can make easier decisions, which is kind of what we're hoping to, uh, to do moving forward. Uh, avoid the, the complex decision-making process that occurs within this, this region in space. So some of the preliminary results we saw from our, our pre-post study on this sensor system, uh, something like a 20% reduction in drivers exposed to the 2.5 to 5.5 second window in space exposed to a, uh, the yellow indication. We saw a 70% reduction in red light running rates. Um, and then we looked at the, the distribution of vehicles under both conditions. And we saw that um, a statistically significant shift in vehicle positions. Um, so fewer vehicles uh, tried to pass through the intersection while caught within the two and a half to five and a half second window. And there was a statistically significant shift in the distribution of vehicles in front of the dilemma zone, which is kind of what this sensor mechanism is supposed to, supposed to present in the first place. And as, as any good OSU mm -hmm. presentation should conclude, uh, go Beavers. Um, I'd like to open up uh, questions from the room now at that point. Yes? You spoke about the permissive yellow law and the restrictive yellow law. Sure. Have you done any research about whether there are significant differences between collision levels in states that have the restrictive law versus the... What is it, the permissive law? It's a fantastic question. It's one that we definitely identified when we were kind of going through all the different dimensions of this problem. Um, we have access to very high fidelity information out in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the laboratories I used to work with was called UMass Safe. It's basically a traffic data collection clearinghouse. And at the state level, it's one of the sort of the best, um, the best pieces of information for crash data in the country. So we have great information from Massachusetts. I'm hoping to try and weigh in on that question based on some of the crash data that we have access to here in Oregon. So that's one of those ongoing questions that we're digging into now. But great point. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I'm from Utah, and I know they have the restrictive yellow law. And Oh, no one stops on a yellow there. So sure. I mean, and I've noticed in Oregon, most people do stop on a yellow. So, I, just kind of empirically, it seems like there should, there might be a difference. Uh, we we absolutely perceive that there's going to be a difference in driver behavior based on. Uh, cultural norms about how to interact with that signal. So one of our follow-up studies, which will probably take place this summer, is grabbing some of this kind of information here in Oregon and trying to understand to how it correlates back to what we were looking at in New England. Yeah. Oh, they do? Yeah. You said you're restricted. Oh, permissive. I, I get them mixed okay. up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, oh, Um, I'm one of the ones that came in late, um, and at the risk of being redundant, could you just some really quickly summarize the um, dilemma zone? What what the attributes of that are? Is yeah, sure, sure, sure. Not a problem at okay. all. So th there's basically two kinds of dilemma zones. There's one that's caused by um, poor design, or what we're going to call as poor design, and one that's caused by um, drivers' difficulty in making the decision. And we're basically talking about the interaction at a signalized intersection where a driver is approaching it and you're exposed to the solid yellow indication. And what are you going to do? You have one of two options. You're either going to stop at the stop bar or clear the intersection. And sometimes within this region in space, we choose the, the, the wrong action. So it's a general step back from the intersection a little bit. Sure, so sure. So the actual dilemma zone is, do I have enough time to make the yellow or do I not? Right, right, right. And there's, there's a couple of different boundary conditions right. that have been discussed throughout the, the course of the last 50 years or so. Other questions? Yeah, Peter. I just wonder if you could comment on the natural naturalistic behavior study. Um, considering the recent challenges we've had on Wall Street recently, I'm just wondering what, what you think about. I mean, people tend to take advantage where they think they perhaps can. And so if we're designing for that 1% or the 15%, there's a likelihood, strong likelihood that the 15% may choose poorly. And so my question is, do you think that we should be doing that in the absence of enforcement, or should we be doing those studies with adequate enforcement where people do obey the laws of the land um, and, and are adhering to proper standards? It's, it's very interesting that you bring that up. One, one, of the, one of the ideas that we've had in looking at some of these different technologies and that naturalistic work we've been doing is it'd be, it'd be fascinating to me to see how something like one of those radar-based sensor systems works in conjunction with red light running enforcement. And that was one of the ideas that we've actually been banging around ourselves quite a bit. So we're hoping to take advantage of some of that. I, I think it's a fantastic thought, though. Yes? I just want to request, is it possible for you to... Use the, uh, here, use this microphone. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, it's just a request. Uh, sure. Since I came late also along with other 18 uh, students, is it possible for you to grief, uh, give us a quick, you know, overview of what is this all about today's seminar and what did you say to the remaining of, um, remainder of the class so that we can also learn from it? Sure. I mean, not in detail, right, right, but right. you know, the purpose of that was today's. No, research. absolutely. So this, this idea of a dilemma zone has been in the, the research mechanism for something like 50 years. And there's been a lot of problems uh, based on uh, varying degrees of lexicon and, and differing understandings okay. as to why this problem occurs. Um, so what we wanted to do is go out there and collect a new big set of data um, up until three or four years ago, this sort of information hadn't been collected for about 20 years. Um, and as the, the, the vehicle fleet changes and driver behaviors change, these sorts of decision-making processes, they change over time. Things like app acceptance and all that other stuff, it varies. So it's always good to collect new and fresh information. Um, we wanted to take that naturalistic observation and try and pair it with technology to see if we could uh, remedy the difficulties driver were having in interacting in this situation. Yeah, hand in the back. Thanks. Uh, on the one of the last <laughs> slides, um, the graph with the the uh, space sensor. Sure. Uh, it looked like there were a significant number of stops ahead of the uh, close to the uh, for vehicles close in. Uh huh. Uh, and I wondered what if there's a, some explanation for why there's there's a broader distribution. Uh, uh, let's go back for a sec. That's the one that I was thinking. Right, right, right. <coughs> it's actually, so we're looking at uh, percent distributions. So there's actually not a lot of observations there. So th this, the, the, the utilization of this technology pushed a heck of a lot of our observations right up to the stop bar and then ha gave them a very easy decision to clear through. Um, so even though it's split 50-50, there's not a lot of vehicles that appear in that window in time. Yes. I'm another late arrival, so. Sorry, I was another late arrival, so apologies if this was covered too. But I was wondering about weather and time of day, and if they played any role. In, yeah. Um, in sure, the sure, sure. So, so we we mentioned this before. Whenever we try and do naturalistic studies, we we don't want to collect unless we're specifically considering rain and slick pavements and modifications to that you know frictional coefficient or whatever. We try and collect our data in dry weather. So all of our observations were conducted in dry weather. Uh, in terms of time of day, we collected we collected video observations um, uh, throughout the course of uh, daylight hours. So we had pretty much 12-hour windows where we were collecting from first thing in the morning until um, you know right around dusk in the evenings. Was there any difference like during rush hour, where people more apt to make the you know the more dangerous decision than they would be like you know middle of the day we, we didn't tend to to break it down by our observations per on on an hour of the day basis during congested or uncongested conditions and we were thinking about this a little bit before most of these locations are isolated high speed signalized intersections that don't have huge amounts of congestion yes question in the back you mentioned that um, a couple companies make the space sensors, and I was wondering uh, how widespread the use is, and also whether or not um, they're used in urban environments, perhaps, where there would be signalized you know, timing of signals, sure, um, sure, and what sure. impact that might have on the timing of signals throughout a system. Right, right. So th there's, um, generally speaking, the, this, the, this radar technology is used in one of two ways. It's used as a side fire unit to capture sort of traffic stream parameters um, that can help sort of manage the infrastructure. And then it's used tied to signalized intersections as well um, to collect this information and help drive signal timings. Um, it hasn't been all that widely adopted, generally speaking, um, up until recently, primarily because of cost. So to outfit a single approach with this sort of a sensor system can range in the neighborhood of you know four to six thousand dollars, something like that, um, which is uh, quite a bit more than the traditional inductive loop technology. Up until the cost of asphalt materials went through the roof. So while we were actually in the process of running this study, we started to talk to the the state traffic engineers and some of the folks that do maintenance and operations in the state of Maine, and we have brutal freeze thaw cycles. And they were basically generating pretty decent cost benefit.
benefit comparisons for going towards these sensor systems at their high speed infrastructure um, because all of a sudden it was so expensive to patch pavement and to put the copper in the ground and you know all that stuff um, so it becomes quite a bit more uh, cost effective under the the current economic environment in terms of rural versus urban implementation and this is a little bit outside my area of expertise you tend to see these systems installed um, where you're having um, or, or where you're having perceived risks of dilemma zone conflicts um, at high speed infrastructure where that right angle collision would result in maybe uh, a large number of fatalities or serious injuries. So that, that tends to be the driving catalyst from what I've seen thus far. Yeah, down front. Yeah, were, were all those data points taken in the state of Oregon? All of the, this data was collected in Vermont, and we're hoping that a follow-up, which will take place this summer, is actually going to start to uh, make some of these observations in Oregon, which should help us weigh in on that, the, the, the variation between those two uh, restrictive and permissive laws a little bit. So is, is Vermont a restricted or permissive red? It's a permissive uh, yellow uh, state. So you're, you're allowed to enter the intersection on the yellow, just like Massachusetts and pretty much all of New England. Wouldn't that significantly increase the number of people running the red because of that? Not necessarily. So it's still, it's illegal to run a red light, but you can enter on the yellow. So we actually spent quite a bit of time trying to, so an, another study that followed up on some of this work was a study of driver comprehension and understanding. Um, so one of the facets to this is do drivers understand the message that we're trying to convey to them? And uh, under many signal configurations, um, it, it appears that they don't, um, our, our initial results. And that's some work that we're still trying to write up for publication right now. Um, but I, I think that's a, a very important idea to keep in mind when we think about this stuff. There's a couple of hands in the back there. Um, based on personal experience and my, I didn't get a good picture of the sensor, but do you, is there much um, accountability for the behavior when someone, a driver, sees a sensor on the light? Do you think, I mean, I personally, when I see something on the light, next to the light, camera or sensor, I think it's going to take my picture, and if I run out of light, um, you know, give me a ticket. So is that accounted for at all? That's or? an interesting question. Um, uh, <coughs> mounting sensor systems on cantilevered beams is a fairly common practice. Um, it certainly depends on the municipality that you're, you're driving in, what their preference is for their detection systems. Um, but it, it's certainly not an uncommon occurrence. Um, it's not a question that we tried to, to weigh in on or considered. But it, it's definitely an interesting thought, um, especially when you start thinking about uh, automated enforcement and the impacts of that on driver behavior. Yes, in the back. That was actually my question, but <laughs> I have another <laughs> one. Um, what, did you look at the, um, the differences in motorized vehicles? I mean, buses opposed to trucks, to cars, to motorcycles? Th there's been a big push to try and uh, integrate that into the process. So we do have that information. So we recorded vehicle classification uh, along with everything else. Um, our, sort of our first pass at analysis focused on just an aggregated measure, but we're hoping to pull that out and weigh in on that impact as well. Um, uh, Zimmerman down in Texas did a lot of work trying to integrate um, the impact of heavy vehicles into their um, in pavement algorithms when, when they were looking at dilemma zone mitigation as well. So that, that's definitely an idea that's out there. Um, Gates did it in his dissertation and his, the subsequent publications as well in 2007. Yeah? Um, would the automated sensor be able to do that on the fly with larger vehicles to give them more since they require more stopping distance? It doesn't integrate. So it, it, it's tracking position and speed in real time. It, it doesn't necessarily separate the acceleration, deceleration profiles of heavy vehicles versus not. But there's a quite a bit of technology that's start starting to give us that capability. So there's video detectors right now that will do those kinds of aggregate classifications. So that may be an additional um, piece of information that we can build into this new sort of model. Yeah, sure. Such a beautiful research you have done. I'm very impressed by this research you have done. It is a great task to save human life. And uh, is, is it possible for you to involve the governmental agencies to implement that or at least educate uh, normal drivers outside that you made this research and it's, it's everybody's responsibility to, you know, behave properly and save a human life, save themselves first. And then, consequently, if everybody becomes responsible, then we have a zero 
mortality rate on our highways. So is this, uh, you are approaching in, in that sense that you have a part of gold sitting with you in your mind on the computer. Are you sharing that with the other agencies who, you know, actually implement? Absolutely. So we're lucky enough, this was a project funded by the Vermont Agency of Transportation, specifically trying to provide recommendations to improve those, uh, their timing policies, their detector policies at these locations. So they took uh, our recommendations and actually retrofitted and modified the way that they do uh, clearance timing intervals and detector placements across the entire state. So we, we got some pretty interesting results um, from that. Generally, our mission in terms of transportation safety, when we come up with uh, valuable findings and contributions, is to disseminate it. It's sort of one of our responsibilities as researchers. And I, I'm very happy as a member of the, the OSU community to be affiliated with OTREC. That's doing a heck of a nice job trying to get some of these research results out there to the public. So it, it's something we're trying to do now, and we're going to try and do better moving forward in the future. Take this over. Sure. Yes. Have you looked into the uh, intersection geometry design? Like, say, if it's a traditional four-leg intersection, or like the lane width, pavement material, or the grading of the street? So, so we did full inventories at all of the locations that we considered, and we looked at, you know, we got the, the, the CAD plans for the, the horizontal vertical alignment, the, the, the curb cuts, the lane widths, all of that information. We got all of the signal timing information, and, you know, w we tried to aggregate our sample set as best we could, um, but we, we didn't feel necessarily, w we tried weighing in on the, the impact of geometric characteristics in terms of the driver behavior, and I think that there is some influence um, but we weren't able to pull statistical significance out of the distributions. So as we continue to grow this database using the same strategies here in Oregon, I think we're going to be able to start to weigh in at least uh, more substantively in that area. But it, it's a really good point. What's, a, what's the, the impact of intersection design on some of these characteristics? Yes. I just want to ask, when was this study done, and uh, how did uh, like DOT or whoever uh, seen the results react to it? And uh, who's been adopting this recently, or how did people? Sure, sure. So the, the data was collected um, in 2007 and 2008. So that's kind of when we built our database. The final report was um, submitted to the Vermont Agency of Transportation in early 2009. And at a minimum, they accepted um, enthusiastically some of our recommendations for where to use things like uh, radar detection, where to lengthen their yellow timings, where they might want to consider moving their advanced detectors. Um, and they made some, some modifications to these locations. And they're hoping as funds become available in their maintenance budgets and operations budgets that they're going to be able to expand some of those recommendations to other locations around the state. Yeah, Peter. You, you mentioned the length and the yellows. So do you, would you perceive that a driver would then end up using the yellow more because there's a habituation? Because if the, longer, the, the yellow's longer, the state law suggests that you can enter the intersection on yellow. So therefore, if, it's, if you've made it longer, I'm just going to go ahead and take advantage of that. Right, right. And have right. you ever recommended um, in those studies a shorter yellow, perhaps, because you didn't find that people were using at the yellow? At these particular, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that we looked at for Vermont, um, we didn't recommend shortening any of their timing sequences. Um, we recommend uh, half second uh, increases to the yellow time in a couple of different locations. Um, but y your point is very well taken. As we add these buffers to try, in our minds, to improve safety, um, in, in some situations, we may be um, increasing the likelihood of drivers violating uh, those conditions. And it's something that we have to be aware of. There was a, a pretty nice ITE paper that was put out by the, the Southern Section Technical Committee reevaluating timing policies in North Carolina. And one of the recommendations, one of the motivators for them trying to weigh in on this timing practices issue was the fact that they were seeing uh, slowly lengthening all red intervals, um, which is this buffer that we provide to try and clear vehicles from the intersection to minimize the likelihood of red light um, running collisions um, or collisions of any type within the, within the intersection. And what they saw was, as they were increasing their red times, um, people were basically just taking advantage of it. So they were, they were running the red because they knew they had enough time to get through the intersection safely. So that's something that we, we have to be cognizant of, certainly. 
Yeah. Yeah, are you guys um, working together with, like, other states in the Northwest to try and get everyone kind of on the same page? Like, is Washington and Idaho under the same like driving permissive or restrictive laws that Oregon is? It's one of the problems that's been, th the variability in all these different dimensions is one of the problems we've had with this issue at that, that high speed signalized intersections. Um, there is some large NCHRP funded research, so nationwide efforts right now, that are focused on trying to build ideal timing sequences that could be adopted as standards of practice across the United States. Um, and some of that work is being spearheaded down at Wayne State right now. Um, so that's probably where the forefront of some of this stuff is coming from. Um, one of the interesting questions that folks are trying to weigh in on is what does uh, driver age um, ha have an impact in terms of reaction times for some of these, some of these decision-making processes? We don't have really good data on that question yet. There was one question on the web, I think one was answered, but the other one was, would it be useful to do similar research at an urban, more congested intersection, or, or is there really as much benefit in that type of situation? There, I mean, there's always value in trying to understand how um, system users interact with the infrastructure we build. So uh, yes, absolutely, we, should, we always need to do more research. But I think the cost benefit really occurs at some of this high-speed infrastructure where the potential failures are much more severe. We thank our speaker. I want to put our plug in um, because there were no more questions, right? Okay. Um, our, put our plug in for next week's speaker, who is David Kurth from Cambridge Systematics. He's going to be talking about modeling high speed rail ridership and revenue in California. So, all of you who are interested in high speed rail, uh, hopefully, we'll see you there. The students who got here late because of the classroom scheduling thing, check in um, afterwards so we can get your attendance and you answer any questions you may have. But thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hurwitz, for coming. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thanks for, thanks for coming in. Oh, yeah.